Welcome to Evensong. This evening we're beginning the Feast of St. Bartholomew, and so I'll be talking about Bartholomew later on. Uh, it's good that we're able to worship both online and, of course, in reality in this church. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble, nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent and obedient heart, to the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we most chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore, I pray and beseech you, as many as are here present, to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice unto the throne of the heavenly grace, saying after me, Almighty and most and merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We, we have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We, we have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things which we ought not to have done, and there is no confidence. But thou, O Lord, have mercy upon us, miserable offenders, 
Spare thou them, O God, which confess their faults. Restore thou them that are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind, in Christ Jesus our Lord. And grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life, to the glory of thy holy name. Amen. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who desireth not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, and hath given power and commandment to his ministers to declare and pronounce to his people, being penitent, the absolution and remission of their sins. He pardoneth and absolveth all them that truly repent and unfeignedly believe his holy gospel. Wherefore, let us beseech him to grant us true repentance and his Holy Spirit, and that those things may please him which we do at this present, and that the rest of our life hereafter may be pure and holy, so that at the last we may come to his eternal joy, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O Lord of the fathers, by your love shall show forth thy grace. O God, I speak to O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost. As it was in the beginning, sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving, and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Here begins the eighth verse of the sixth chapter of the second book of Kings. Now the king of Aram was at war with Israel. After conferring with his officers, he said, I will set up my camp in such and such a place. The man of God sent word to the king of Israel, Beware of passing that place, because the Arameans are going down there. So the king of Israel checked on the place indicated by the man of God. Time and again, Elisha warned the king, so that he was on his guard in such places. This enraged the king of Aram. He summoned his officers and demanded of them, Tell me, which of us is on the side of the king of Israel? None of us, my lord the king, said one of his officers. But Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the very words that you speak in your bedroom. Go, find out where he is, 
the king ordered, so that I can send men and capture him. The report came back, he is in Dothan. Then he sent horses and chariots and a strong force there. They went by night and surrounded the city. When the servant of the man of God got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh no, my lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elijah prayed, open his eyes, Lord, so that he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all round Elisha. As the enemy came down towards him, Elisha prayed to the Lord, strike this army with blindness. So he struck them with blindness, as Elisha had asked. Elisha told them, this is not the road and this is not the city. Follow me and I will lead you to the man you are looking for. And he led them to Samaria. After they entered the city, Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men so they can see. Then the Lord opened their eyes and they looked, and there they were inside Samaria. So the king of Israel saw them. He asked Elisha, shall I kill them, my father? Shall I kill them? Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill those who you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so that they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a great feast for them and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away and they returned to their master. So the bands of Aram stopped them raiding Israel's territory. Here ends the first lesson. Here beginneth the 15th verse of the 17th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. And they that conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a commandment to Silas and Timotheus for to come to him with all speed, they departed. 
Now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was stirred in him when he saw the city wholly given to idolatry. Therefore disputed he in the synagogue with the Jews, and with the devout persons, and in the market daily with them that met with him. Then certain philosophers of the Epicureans and of the Stoics encountered him, and some said, What will this babbler say? Other some, He seems to be a set forth of strange gods, because he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to Arapyrgus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine whereof thou speakest is? For thou bringest certain strange things to our ears, we would know therefore what these things mean. For all the Athenians and strangers which were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear some new thing. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, E man of Athens, I perceive that in all things ye are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that his Lord of heaven and earth dwelleth not in temples made with hands, neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he giveth to all life and breath and all things and hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. That they should seek the Lord, if haply they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live, and move, and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring. For as much as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold, or silver, or stone, graven by art and man's device. And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men in that he hath raised him from the dead. And when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, and others said, We'll hear thee again of this matter. So Paul departed from among them. Howbeit certain men clave unto him, and believed. Among the which was Dionysus the Aplogeogite, and a woman named Demaris, and others with them. Here endeth the second lesson. Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection. 
resurrection of the body, and the life of the Amen. Amen. and everlasting God, who didst give to thine apostle Bartholomew grace truly to believe and to preach thy word, grant we beseech thee unto thy church to love that word which he believed, and both to preach and receive the same, through Jesus Christ our Lord. O God, from whom all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works do proceed, give unto thy servant that peace which the world cannot give, that both our hearts may be set to obey thy commandments, and also that by thee we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may pass our time in rest and quietness, through the merits of Jesus Christ our Saviour. Lighten our darkness, we beseech thee, O Lord, and by thy great mercy defend us from all perils and dangers of this night, for the love of thy only Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. May I speak in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This evening, as I mentioned earlier, we begin the Feast of St. Bartholomew, and we know almost nothing about him. The one thing we do know is that he was one of the Twelve. So these Twelve, these first followers of Jesus, I imagine that they were ordinary young men. The problem with lots of paintings of the Apostles is that they paint them when they're old, but we forget that they were probably just young, unmarried, possibly teenagers. They were, I imagine, the sort of men who go to discos, who enjoy a game of football and chatting up girls, and people who can get very enthused about things. That's how I imagine Bartholomew and his disciples. Living in the lakeside world of Galilee, they find themselves suddenly confronted with something different. A teacher who inspires them with a huge new set of ideals. Ideals which they don't always grasp, 
but they have all the passion of youth and they follow him because he's the sort of person who draws people to himself. So we remember among them Bartholomew. He was attracted by Jesus' vision and follows him. The revolution, because that's what it is, the revolution which Jesus proclaims in the Gospels, which he lives out in his life, and which is our revolution, is about many things. One of them is about the nature of power. And some of the disciples didn't quite grasp this to begin with. They wanted to know, for instance, who among them was the top dog. And Jesus goes on to remind them that that sort of way of thinking is the way of this world. It's not his vision. Dictators and despots lord it. The catastrophe which happened a couple of weeks back in Beirut comes from that old model of leadership there, where the leaders are there to milk the poor, to milk the rich, to milk everybody. The powerful who look after themselves and their own. I wonder if we've ever thought that when it comes to an election, how often do politicians encourage us to be selfish? They offer us things that will make me better as opposed to change the world. So, Bartholomew is faced with is a vision of a world which is simply different. One of these young men, inspired by Jesus, and from that handful has sprung up a church which is called to be like them, wanting to do the will of God, but sometimes failing to grasp what God wants, sometimes imagining that what we like is what God wants, and it's not always the same thing. Jesus challenges us to look at the way we see the world. We as Christians have a set of values as a society which suggests that what matters in this world is power and success, wealth and beauty, but that's not what we want. It's really important to say to people, God sees you as you are and loves you as you are, no matter how powerful, successful or beautiful you happen to be. You do not have to have a perfect house, a perfect family, the top job or a big car. You are valued already, whoever you are. And the most important thing, says Jesus to his disciples, and which they really have difficulty in grasping, is that the greater you are, the more you serve others. And when we are serving the needs of others, then we are actually godlike. Because when we look at Jesus Christ serving, we see God in action. Reality is there. To serve is what we are called to do. And that is what matters. I have no idea whether Bartholomew really grasped that. But today we give thanks that this is what he and we are called to be. To God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who love and serve, be praise and glory now and always.
Let us pray. In our prayers today we remember in particular all students and teachers, our universities as they go through the process of organising a new intake. We pray for all those who are involved in any way in dealing with the pandemic in this country and throughout the world, in particular for those who are researching new ways of dealing with it. And we continue to remember the people of Beirut and of the Lebanon as they continue to recover from the catastrophic explosion there. We pray for all charities and all NGOs seeking to make lives better there. O oh God, the creator and preserver of all people, we humbly beseech thee for all sorts of conditions, that thou wouldest be pleased to make thy ways known unto them, thy saving health unto all nations. More especially we pray for the good estate of the Catholic Church, that it may be so guided and governed by thy good spirit, that all who profess and call themselves Christians may be led into the way of truth and hold the faith in unity of spirit, in the bond of peace and in righteousness of life. Finally, we commend to thy fatherly goodness all those who are in any ways afflicted or distressed in mind, body or estate especially those for whom our prayers are desired, that it may please thee to comfort and relieve them according to their several necessities, giving them patience under their sufferings and a happy issue out of all their afflictions. And this we beg for Jesus Christ, his sake. Amen. And together we say the grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. God give you grace to follow Bartholomew, the Twelve and all the saints in a life of service and of joy. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always.